Did you hear how the amp just started getting softer? I didn't do anything. That was weird. It's an old deluxe reverb. God knows what's wrong with it. Uh, but anyway, look at this, guys. I was going to tell you, I'm still sick. I still got the COVID. But I'm doing a little better. Got the coffee here with the uh, number one dad thing on there. Oh, that's a fairly old picture. My kid's in college now. Mm. So, just kidding about that. Um, let's see. What's going on? I was thinking about, you know, well, thanks for like all the kind words about the, uh, the last couple of videos I put up. It really is the Corona lessons again. Maybe I should put up sunglasses on so you can't see my uh, blue eyes, but I feel all right, guys. Don't worry. You don't have to keep sending um, comments. Get well, Larry. I'm fine. This really hasn't been that bad at all. I mean, I've had common colds that are way fucking worse than this stuff, man. And I'm, I'm, I'm not bragging in any way, saying I'm a tough guy. And I'm also very uh, thankful and grateful that I didn't get the bad kind of COVID that a lot of you out there had, okay? So, uh, um, I was thinking about, you know, people are always saying, you know, Tommy B, uh, little Tommy, Starship Trooper, they say. You know a lot of chords, man. You know a lot of chords, and, and I'm like... Uh, you know, you know. I, th I was thinking about that today, because, like I said before, I've got <laughs> plenty of time to think lately. And uh, you know, man, uh, when I'm, I, I, you know, when I'm on a session, right? And, and there's a lot of downtime on a session, right? There's a lot of time in between songs where, where you're just sitting there with your instrument, and people are trying to hash out arrangement things. And I usually check out during most of that. Um. You know, I worked with um, Bob Ezrin one time, famous producer. Um, he's made two of my all-time favorite records. He made P Peter Gabriel's first solo album, and um, he made um, The Wall, which, you know, I mean, how are you going to argue with that? He's, he did all the Alice Cooper stuff, you know. Uh, but Bob's, Bob's a beautiful guy. I got to know him a little bit. We, we went out to dinner a time or two, and um, this is years ago. And you know me, I grilled him with, uh, I'll get back to the point in a minute, but I just wanted a quick story here. While we're sitting at dinner, I was just like, Bob, tell me anything you can remember about working on the first Gabriel solo album, you know? And he said, uh, Peter came and stayed at his house. This is probably all an interview somewhere you could look up elsewhere, but I'm just telling you what I remember that he told me. He said that Peter Gabriel used to come to his house and stay there. And he'd be down in the basement banging on an upright all day, writing songs for that first album. And Bob would be up in his office working. And if you ever heard of anything he liked, he would yell down, that's good, Peter, keep that. And they, you know, that kind of thing. So they ended up working up the first album, which is a fucking amazing album. I mean, I could probably name every track on it by heart. Salisbury Hill, Moribund the Burgermeister, Slow Burn, Here Comes the Flood. Oh man. Excuse me, Humdrum. So many great songs on that record. Down the Dolce Vita. Um, Modern Love. God, I love that one. Um, I'm a huge Gabriel fan, by the way, as you guys know. I, I love his solo work as much as I love his work in the early Genesis, you know. But, but uh, Bob was saying that, you know, when they put the band together for the first album, you know, he had, he had Larry Fast, Robert Fripp, you know, Jerry Murata, Tony Levin, of course, on bass, you know. Um, Steve Hunter was also there, who played that amazing, iconic, you know. Riff, you know. And um, he said that the whole time they were at rehearsals, you know, Peter was showing all the guys the tunes, you know, and... Um, some of these tunes are pretty complex, you know, they weren't just like your typical, you know, predictable changes, you know. And he said the whole time he was showing everybody the tunes, uh, Tony Levin was just over in the corner reading a book. Like, acting like he wasn't even paying attention. And then they walk out there and he, of course he knew everything. He was, you know, he's got that kind of mind. 
I never met Tony. I never worked with him, but, you know, God, I am such a fan of his work. Oh, my God. I would love to hang with him, meet him someday. I mean, I am... When I, as I mentioned in a previous episode a long time ago, um, the best concert I ever saw in my entire life was uh, Sting and Peter Gabriel together on opening night of, of the tour they did, you know, what, seven years ago or something like that. And I was in very good seats right up front. And in the shows, Tony Levin likes to uh, get a camera out and take pictures of the crowd. And he posted them online, and I saw myself in the photos that he took. Me and my, my dear ex-wife, I think it was in Louisville. It was either in Louisville or Cincinnati, I can't remember. But it was the best concert I've ever seen. I was in tears the whole time. Man, but uh, back to what I was talking about. Um, uh, when I'm on these sessions, you know, sometimes I try to just let the stuff, I try to just sit there and sort of let most of it go over me but retain the really important stuff, you know? A lot of people are really, you know, actively changing things on their chart. Oh, yeah, eighth bar, the second chorus is a four chord. Okay, I don't even write that shit down. I don't even, I just, it, it goes in. I don't know how I retain it all. I never make chart changes, um, and I play it. And, uh, but the whole time I'm sitting there, I'm usually thinking about other things. Um, I'm thinking about my hands just, just grab, uh, I'm just constantly searching for ways to voice chords. You know, um, any possible way that I can that I can think of to voice a chord in an odd way or a unique open way is what I'm thinking about. I mean, I, I didn't even realize that until recently, but my hands just are just constantly looking for these these shapes. You know, so I'm thinking about you know I was thinking about A major last night while I'm laying in bed. I was just thinking about the 80 billion ways that I've figured out how to voice an expensive A major tonality chord with all kind of bonus notes in it. You know, when I say bonus notes, I mean, I mean, uh, that's what Tim Lauer, the keyboard player, calls them, bonus notes, you know. You got an A major tonality, okay? See, I'm no jazz theory expert, but here's how I think of this, this shit. When you're thinking about A major tonality, there's a lot of notes you can add to the root third, fifth of A major, root third, major third and fifth to make it even more deluxe, okay? You know, of course you can add the nine, right? Which is, you know, you know, everybody knows that chord, you know, right? You know, that's like the first one you'd add, okay? And you can add the major seven. You can add a, ma a major six. You can add a sus, you can add, uh, you can even add a flat five and still retain its major tonality. There's only a few notes you have to avoid. What are they? Okay, no dominant sevens, right? No flat sixes, no minor thirds, and no minor seconds. If you can stay away, you know, if you can stay away from all those, any group, let's see, how many major tonality notes do we have that work? Okay, this one works of the scale. A, B, the second works. Um, C, C sharp works, the third, of course. D works, the sus. Like I said, the flat five, D sharp, it works sometimes. You gotta be careful. The fifth, of course, works. The six works, and the major seven really works. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Does eight of the 12 notes in the scale work to create a major tonality A chord, okay? Or any chord, in any key. So that's what my brain is thinking about, you know? Um, combining that group of eight notes with all kind of weird open strings in the middle and stuff. And, um, you know, uh, interesting ways to voice chords. Because as I've said before, and, I, and I've, I got a lot of shit for this, saying this earlier, but I, I, my, I, my life's work is, is staying away from the traditional jazz voicings of chords, such as A major seven, or 
A major seven, or A major seven, or A major seven, or this. See, I just will not, will not play that. I will not. Um, the only time I would ever play that is if I was trying to play something that sounded extremely traditional in its sort of, um, you know, uh, old school jazz uh, melody approach. That's the only, but I would never use any of that shit. And I hope I'm not pissing anybody off out there because I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those chords. Those chords have been kicking ass for a long time. I just don't play that shit. I don't play it. Okay, so what I'm thinking about is piano voicings. I'm thinking about opening up these extensions so that you get all kind of interesting colors happening. Okay, let's just say, for example, let's take your chord. This is just basic 101 shit, okay? Um, let's just take your A sus chord. Your A add nine chord, where, you, where you, you take your A major and you lift off, right? Everybody knows that fucking chord, you know? Even the Beatles used it, and they, they, they rarely used add nines but they used it on that song. Um, the Beatles, as I've said before, were pretty militant about staying with real straight, no bonus note chords, you know? Majors, minors, sevens, they didn't mess around much with, uh, you know, fancy extensions, you know? Um, but they didn't need to because they were the greatest songwriters that ever lived on this planet. And uh, see, okay, let's just take this chord and let's just, Goof with this chord, okay? What if we put the major seven of the fourth fret of the high E string on top? Okay, now we got something. What if we put the six on top? All right. What if we, what if we invert this part of it up to here? And then we keep that major seven on top with the open B string in the middle. Pretty cool. What if we do this? Uh, what if we take that major seven and move it up to a, a nine? Yeah. What if we take these three and add a major seven? Keep these where they are and add a major seven. Where would, we, where would we do that? If we wanted to keep this A string open. We can go like this. Right here. Get that A major seven right there with the, the G sharp on the B string. That's a cool chord. Okay, now what if we wanted to uh, play an A chord and we wanted the, the root and the sus Together, I've talked about this before. Okay, what about this? What about this? What about this? about this what about this what about this what about this what about this right here Flat five kind of sounds still major to me. Classic B over A. Okay. There's just literally endless combinations of these things that you can do all up and down the neck that just sound cool as hell. And um, it can be used. The thing I love about this kind of shit is that it can be used in pop music. It, you know, this is not fancy jazz stuff. This is stuff that you can color, you know, pop music with. You know, uh, that's what I've always tried to stay on track with. 
my whole life. I've, I've never been interested in learning anything that I couldn't use in a popular music context. You know what I'm saying? I'm not a jazz guy. I mean, I can fake some bullshit jazz, but it's not where my heart's at. Um, I'm always looking for things that I can use in either traditional country, modern country, modern rock, classic rock, or weirdo futuristic pop, or, you know, trippy rock. You know, that's really all I care about. Any other kind of music, you know, whatever. Um, you know, so there you go. R&B, blues, sometimes. Um, not where my heart's at, again, like I've told you guys, but I respect it. I respect all great music, you know. Um, so these types of things are what goes on in Larry's head, if you're wondering. And, and uh, Larry also has a very stuffy nose and very dead-looking eyes from the COVID. And uh, I just restrung this old Les Paul today and uh, moved a couple saddles because the intonation was really starting to bug him. I turned some saddles around. You know, as long as I've had this guitar, I've never really put it under the microscope as on a setup, you know, intonation-wise. And the last few sessions I played it on, I was like, damn, this thing's out of tune. So I, I was like, I gotta fix that problem. I fixed it today. This thing's right in tune now. I think I was just so enamored with the guitar itself that I was like, forgot to set it up, you know? What's that chord? F sharp minor six, dominant seven. I told you this one before. D major seven. Look at that voicing of a D major seven. D major D major nine, really, because open D string in the middle. You know, there you go, guys. Jesus, twenty minutes. Oh God. You know, the thing is, my internet. The internet at my house sucks. The guy that installed it when I first moved in here, he had to put the router like way over in, in the garage and it's like, it takes me fucking forever to up upload one of these videos. So I, when they get too long, it's not good. Um, what else can we talk about? Oh God. Uh, I think that's it for now. Just think about these chords. Think about opening this shit up. Use the open strings to, um, you know, expand your chord voicings and get away from playing in boxes and traditional um, shapes that, you know. Oh, and I was going to say one more thing. Uh, a guy was, was saying, uh, d does it ever bother you that the gu guitar has such an odd tuning, you know, like where you got a fourth, a fourth, a fourth, and then all of a sudden a third, and then another fourth, you know? Like, why isn't the whole guitar tuned straight across in fourths, right? Yeah, I've goofed with that. I've tried it. But you can't play uh, all day and all night by the kinks with that. I want to hear you try it. Um, you could tune a guitar in all fifths, you know, like a mandolin or a violin. But it's like, there's nothing wrong with the way this thing's tuned, man. I mean, whoever thought of this, like, well, is it the Spanish tuning or whatever? It's a brilliant tuning. I mean, that you can just go like this. And it sounds cool. Or this. on tune that fucker is. Ooh, get that chord in tune. There's a cool chord. That's some lonesome shit right there. chord where you leave the third off
I feel like sometimes I annoy my friends on session because I turn my volume pedal down real soft and I, and I can when they're trying to talk and I'm I'm always looking for these crazy voicings. Sometimes they laugh. All right, that's it, guys. See you later.